Does all things well. There's a theme that was going on. Let go and let God. Trust God and step aside. And it continues on in the message that God has given today. Almighty God. Oh, Father, here we are, Lord. We, your people, Lord. We have gathered here today, Lord. Father, you are all that we have, and we thank you, Lord, because you are all that we need. Lord, we ask that you would look upon every heart, every mind that is here in this place, Lord. We ask that you would move upon us, Lord, that you would provide what each one of us have need for this day. We ask, Lord, that you would bring peace to us, Lord. Father, we ask that you would move upon us, Lord, that you would bring clarity to us, Lord. We ask that you would bring liberty, Lord, in those things that have bound us, Lord, and those things that heap to, keep, keep, tend to hinder us from serving you, Father. We ask that you would move upon those things even right now in your people. Father, have your way in your servant, Lord. Let your will be done, Lord. Oh, God, we love you. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you this day. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Come on, let's go to Mark today. Chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. Mark chapter 5, beginning at verse 25. Mark 5, beginning at 25. Amen. When you found it, please stand. Amen? Amen. Amen. The word of the Lord says, And a certain woman which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press. And said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touches who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman fearing and trembling, knowing that was that what was done in her, and came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace and be whole of thy plague. May the Lord bless you and bless this word. Amen. I want to talk to you a little bit today about the press. The press. If we're going to let go and let God have his way, if we're going to trust God and step out of the way, there's got to be a pressing that takes place. There's got to be an action, a pushing forward. There's got to be a pressure that takes place. And as I was beginning to look over what I might bring today or what the Lord would have me to bring today, he brought back in remembrance uh, a a bike that I had when I was a little boy. My very first big boy bike, so to speak. It was a red bike. It was the bike that had training wheels on it. It was the bike that I actually rode and actually mastered riding bikes to where the training wheels were able to be taken off. And I remember riding that bike, and that day that I realized I can do this without the training wheels. And so I took it to my dad, and he took the training wheels off of it. And I rode that bike all over the place. I loved that bike. Me and that red bike, we got it in. But then one day I was riding that bike, and I hit a bump or something. I don't remember what I did. The bike broke. It was actually in two parts. And I was devastated because my bike was broke. 
So I gathered up the two pieces of the bike, and I took them to my dad. And he looked at it, and I was, I was sure that there was nothing that could be done for the bike. I was sure the bike was finished. But I brought it to my dad, and he looked at it, and he said, oh, hold on, boy. And he went over to his truck. He grabbed a, a nut, a screw, and a washer. And what had happened is in the middle there, there was a section where they were joined together, and he bolted that back together. And in just a couple of minutes, I was back on my way. All right, all right. All right. Now, look, it's important that you understand that when I was dealing with that situation, I did not know if the bike could be fixed. All right. But I knew that whether the bike could be fixed or not, that if I took it to my dad, that he would rectify the problem. I knew that he was going to take care of it. See, I didn't even understand at that point that he was a plumber and that he took nuts and bolts and washers and he tied pipes up into different places. I didn't understand all of that. And I didn't need to understand all that. All I knew if I took it to him, he was either going to fix the bike, he could get me a new bike, or whatever was going on, if I, if I brought it to him, yeah. then he could fix it. And I begin to think so many times we find ourselves in situations just like Moses did when he was standing there at the Red Sea. And he was in a press and things were going on. Right. There was an army that was chasing him. There was a bunch of murmuring people that were there. Wow. And he walked out to the sea and there was no exit. No and God said, well, just hold out your rod. And he didn't tell him, well, you hold out your rod for exactly 12 seconds and then I'm going to part the sea. And then you're going to come on and you're going to cross over. And then all the people are going to make it over. And then when you get to the other side, right then, then I'm going to take care of Pharaoh and them. So now you can go ahead and hold a rod out. That's not what he told him. He simply told him to hold the rod out. Now, Moses was in a predicament then, wasn't he? Because he knew if he didn't, if he didn't, if he didn't accomplish that, if he didn't say the people, he had two problems he was going to have to deal with. Oh, yeah. Because before the Egyptians could have ever got to him, the Israelites was going to get to him. Mm. So he's in a press. He's in a tight spot. Yes, sir. But he made up his mind that he was going to trust God. The word of God says that if you believe on him, you will not be ashamed. You notice the Bible didn't say, and he held a staff out there and nothing happened. Uh -huh. That's right. The Bible doesn't say that he's held a staff out there after he told him, and he looked up in the sky, and he waited, and then the Egyptian army came and slaughtered all of them. All right. All right. The word of God says simply that he trusted. Mm -hmm. He moved, and God moved on his behalf. And so, you know, when I begin to look at the scripture, I begin to think about that. Because so many times we, we, we don't get an opportunity to see the move of God in our lives. God puts us in positions where he wants to show us his glory, where he wants to move on our behalf, where he wants to grow us up, where he wants to give us a deeper, more meaningful understanding of who he is. But he'll take us to that Red Sea moment and he'll say, just hold up the staff and we'll refuse to do it because we're afraid that we're going to be ashamed. We're afraid that we're going to get let down in the midst of that situation. And so as a result of it, we won't trust. We won't lift up the rod. And as a result, we don't have the victory. Because when we are put in the press and we have the opportunity to press forward, we find an opportunity not to. And so I want to talk about this unnamed lady here today All right. because she got a lot of things in here that can help us. And I'm not going to jump around. I'm not going to hoop and holler today. I'm going to talk to you today because some things you need to understand. You understand what I'm telling you today? There's some things that are going on here with this lady that we need to pick up on because they will help us at where we are at right now, where it is, in our walk. Because notice, we don't have any visitors in here today. This is word here today. This is family here today. And we need to understand some things. Look what's going on. It doesn't tell us a whole bunch about this woman's background. It doesn't tell you who she was. It doesn't tell you where she came from. All that's not necessary. That's right. Just like with you, it's not necessary about where you came from and how much money you had or how much money you didn't have. Those things are not important when God shows up on the scene. You know, those things that had, we had value to us back in the day, those things that meant a lot to us, they don't mean nothing to God. And when we get the mind of Christ, they don't mean nothing to us either. Come on now. But see, it's, it's the point of the transition from the old junk 
that old man, that old creature, that old foolishness, that old nonsense into being that new creature, being minded on the things of God, seeking after righteousness. Is that the thing that begin to change the game? Those are the things that begin to help us to press that we can find ourselves in those situations where God can move on our behalf, where we can begin to know him in a way that we've never known him before. The word of God says over in Romans 5, it says that tribulations work in patience. Patience work in experience, experience, hope, and hope maketh us not ashamed. Yes, sir. So in other words, it's a process that we have to get to, to that hope. Yeah. That hope is simply just an expectation that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. Yeah. See, it's a process that we have to get from where we are today to having full expectation that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And then doing it, what he tells us to do, that we may see him move, that we would not be ashamed. But I have to tell you today that that starts with tribulation. Yes, sir, it yes. starts with a pressing. It starts with a tight situation. It starts with a tight moment. Yeah. That's where it starts. And that's where this woman finds herself at today. She finds herself in this situation where things are not going the way that she wants them to go. All right. The word of God said there was a certain woman and she had an issue of blood for 12 years. Now, we don't know what's going on with this woman before those 12 years, but we can assume that she was healthy the tw before the 12 years. In the 13th year, things were going all right for her. But God began to put her in a tight place. He began to put her in a tight situation. And the word of God says that he kept her there for 12 years. Now, you know, if the bishop stood up here and told y'all it was going to take y'all 12 years to get something y'all wanted, y'all need to pass out. We'd have to have the ushers over you fanning and break out the white sheets. 12 whole years? Y'all be at home watching 12 years of slave crying. 12 years. How could it be? But look, sometimes it takes that long just to work stuff out of you. It takes that long for God to get that junk out of you so he can position you in a place where you would trust him enough that you would have an expectation that what he tells you to do, that you would understand and trust him, that you would not be ashamed. But it takes us some time to get to that point. We have to understand that, look, God puts us in the press so that we can press. You understand? Yes, sir. Let me see if I can help you a little bit. Look, a press has a lot of different meanings, and we're going to talk about some of these tonight. A press can be a crowd or a crowded situation or a tight situation. Yeah. A press can be a thronging or a crowding of people together. You're going to see all these pressings in what we're going to talk about tonight. But the one I want to focus on to make sure that you come out of here with today is the last one. And that's an action of pushing forward. Okay, so God put her in a tight situation so that she could push forward. He brought some trouble on her. And the word of God says it went on for 12 years. It says that she had suffered many things of many physicians and she had spent all that she had. In other words, we can assume she probably had a little money. She probably had a little clout, and she got sick. She got in a tight situation, and the word of God says that she speedily went after solving the problem herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She started calling up the doctors. She went to the best physician. She talked to the folks around and said, okay, who do you recommend? If it was today's society, she went on to the Facebook and she started asking folks on now, who should I go to? And, and I got this symptom and I got this symptom and what do you think? And all of these the doctors without no degrees started going on and they wanted to begin to say, well, I think you need to do this and you should do that. And you should go over here and talk to such and such about it. And I went over here to see this doctor right here because I had a big old pimple on my nose. And that's kind of like the problem that you got. And so maybe they can help you out too. And the word of God says she suffered many things. Yeah. She went through many painful processes. And it's a sad thing when we'll trust ourselves and we'll trust other people before we'll trust God. You know, it's some folk, they won't even trust themselves with their own money, let alone with nobody else's money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they want to they take it upon themselves to handle a money situation. Yeah. They don't, they don't trust their own self around somebody else. They don't trust their own advice, but they want to be the first one to step up to give advice to somebody else. 
They ain't consulted God. They ain't asked God. They just know. Because they so really smart that they done messed their life up so good. So they got something they want to tell you. They want to help you with yours. Look. Look here. When we find ourselves in this tight and these hard times, many times all we see is the pain. She spent 12 years running from doctor to physician to to this, the one over here, to, to throw the chicken bones on top of the garbage can, to, to go on over here, to read the cards and tell me what it is I need to do over here, to what does the astrology and astronomy say today? She went through all of that foolishness. And all it got her was, was the end of 26. It says, and nothing bettered. It didn't get any better. In fact, it says, but rather, it grew worse. God is putting her in this position, and he keeps on pressing her. And she keeps on doing her own thing. She keeps on trying in her way. She keeps on trying to fix it. She got a new plan. She heard something new that came out of the Far East, and they got some kind of remedy out there, and she wanted to do that. And we do the same thing. We go out to the Internet, and we Google this, and we say, well, you know what? I'm going to try this now. Or, you know, I'm going to try this right here. And, and maybe this will work over here. And this, this sounds like this is pretty good right here. And this will take care of at least of a couple of symptoms that I have. It might not solve all the problems, but maybe it'll take care of these dizzy spells that I have. And we'll do the same thing. We'll try everything but try Jesus. See, this is the time to try Jesus, brothers and sisters. See, this is the time. When you, all that stuff you're going through, that stuff that's hindering you from praising when it comes time to praise, that stuff that's weighing on your shoulder that got you in that seat when you need to be up praising God, see, this is the time for you to get that stuff off of you. It's time to trust God and lay that stuff aside and say, I'm going to praise him. Yeah. See, because if you try Jesus, you will not be ashamed. Y'all look at me like I'm crazy today. Look, look, we got to understand that the pressure points, those hard situations, we see them as painful. We see them as hurting. We see them as times of struggle. God sees it as times of positions. You see, there are times when my son gets out of line. And what I do is I grab him in the top of his head like this here. And I turn him in the direction that I want him to do. And he can't stand it. Who that bothers him that I would actually grab his head and manipulate his world like that. Whoa. He got a problem with that. And there are times he'll, mm -hmm, he'll, kick, he'll kick my hand off his head. Uh, uh -huh, that's all right. mm -hmm. And you know what I do? I put it right back on his head. Come on now. Because yeah. I'm above him. I'm above him in authority. I'm above him in height as well. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Come and on. God do the same thing to you. Yeah. And you see it as just struggles. You see it as just dealing with problems. How come, man, how come the car broke down? Man, how come she acting like this again? Man, how come this keep going on? How come this problem keeps happening? And why the bank account down low again? And Lord, we got to go through this again? again? And he's trying to steer you in the path that he wants you to go. He says, come to me with that mess. He says, bring that junk over to me with that. He says, quit going over there and being a homunger every time something bad happens to you. He says, quit lying every time you get pressed and put in a situation. He keeps trying to position you and turn you in the direction he wants to have you in. But we keep turning the shoulder. We keep pulling away the shoulder. And as a result, we never get what God has for us. He wants to position you for blessings. I was having a conversation with a young man today, and he was telling me about how he wanted a wife, and I asked him, I said, well, give me the criteria of what you're looking for in a wife. And he went and asked me, you know, oh, I wanted to be self-sufficient, and I wanted to be kind of cute and everything. And I said, okay, that's nice. I said, is it okay if she be a, a great big old hoe? And he said, no, no, I don't want her to be no hoe. I want her to be. And so he went out, and he began to really think about and qualify the answer that he was giving me about what he was looking for. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, I, I get it now. I know what you're looking for. And he says, what am I looking for? I said, you're looking for a woman that's holy. Mm -hmm. I said, you didn't articulate it that way, but when you added up what you were saying is that you were looking for a woman that was holy. Yeah. And, I, and I asked him, and I said, and so why would God give you a holy woman if you're not holy? I said, if you had a daughter, and some dude came to you and said, hey, you know, I want to take your daughter. I, you know, I got some plans for her. I want to take care of it. I said, you going to let her go? He said, no, I ain't going to let her go. I said, so why would God do that to you when you came asking about one of his daughters? All right, now. All right, all right. 
But look, see, we got to get to the point where we understand that God is trying to position us to where we can receive his blessings. This young man didn't understand that he needed to be positioned in the right place in order to receive what he wanted. God didn't have no problem giving him a holy woman. He just got to get holy. It's not that hard. It's simple to me. But it was difficult to him because he refused to bend to the will of God. And that's what's going on with us. She was refusing to bend to the will of God. But see, a beautiful thing happened to this woman. A beautiful thing happened. In 26, it says she spent all that she had. In other words, she got to the point where she was tired of trying to do it her way. She arrived at that breaking point. The press got on her so hard that she began to hear that. We'll, we'll, we'll fight tooth and nail just so we don't have to hear that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's the beginning of life. That's, that's, that's the beginning. God loves a contrite heart. Yes, sir. A broken heart. Yes. A broken spirit. One that doesn't have any pride in it. One that's not lifted up against it. One that when the hand hits the head to guide you, you say, where do you want me to go? Wherever you want me to go, I'm ready to do it your way. This is the situation that we have to be in. Yes, sir. Look, so many times we try to fight God or we try to fight Satan with the flesh. Mm-hmm. Satan will come on us and he'll say, yeah, go on and do that. Go on and do this and do this. And we know we don't need to do that. We know there's no value in it, but we try to fight it in the flesh. We want to fight it with our Facebook friends. Yeah, yeah. We want to fight it on Twitter. We want to fight it with our homegirls that still go to the club four nights a week. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we want to address the issue. And I liken that to trying to fight a forest fire with gasoline. You understand? You actually help, de- you actually help defeat yourself in that effort when you try to fight with the flesh. Our weapons of warfare are not carnal. We know this. But yet how come when we find ourselves in the press, we don't go with what we know? But look, she got to the point where she got broken. And then look, a beautiful thing happened. In 27, she heard about Jesus. This Jesus Christ that we stand up here and preach week in and week out. I've said many a times, other folks don't eat like we eat. We eat good here. But I mean, I have to even assess that because I say we get served well. Sometimes we don't eat. We'll come and the buffet is laid out like no other. God prepares the bread of life for you. And you refuse to eat. We hear, but it's not the breaking of your heart. It's the hardening of your heart. It's the hardening to the word of God where you refuse to hear it because that little bald and black man up there can't know what he's talking about. Because he ain't been through nothing. How are you going to tell me about he been dealing with 12 years or something? He ain't dealing with nothing. He got a good job and everything is going on good with him. You don't know. You don't know. You don't have no clue. I can stand up here from now till in the morning and testify to you about all the things I done been through and what God done brought me out of. You understand? Make no mistake about it because God had to break me to get me to the point where I could be here to do what he called me to do. Forget about what I had. Forget about it in the past. Whatever I had in the past didn't make me want to come up here and give my life to these people and give my life to Christ and just serve him. That was a breaking process that had to go on. And it took a long time. And he had to put some things on me. He had to put a couple of vice grips on me and say, okay, okay, Minister Barnes. Yeah, you're a minister. You're a minister whether you like it or not. You can be in a club. You can drink all the Ciroc you want to tonight. You're still a minister. I still call you to preach this gospel. Do what? Yeah, come on. Cut up if you want to. I got something for you. Your marriage. Your finances, your health, your mind. Oh, Lord. Till I cry to say I don't want no more. That was a break. And I want you to know, it's many of us in here that's experienced a break. But I need you to know that God will come back. And he say, no, that's too much of you over there. We're going to break that down. He get in a nice fine powder, 
the way he wants it, where it's nice and pliable, where it's moldable, then he can shape it and he can form it the way he wants to, then you're ready. It's a painful process, but it's a process we have to trust. We don't trust the process. That's the problem we get into so many times is we refuse to trust the process. Yes, I know God is doing something here, but because I'm not quite sure what he's doing and I don't really like the way it feels, I'm not going to go along with the program. Yes, sir. I'm here to tell you today, you can't experience God the way God wants you to experience him until you get to that point where you can care less about what it looked like where you can care less about what it feels like, where you can be focused in on the press, that, Lord, I'm going to press on to see what it is that you have for me. A word came to us a couple of weeks ago. I was sitting back there in the booth. I was minding my own business. Come on. The bishop asked my wife, he says, uh, y'all been looking for your house? Y'all, It's time for y'all to get your house. He said, y'all ain't been looking no more, and we haven't been looking. We had gave off on looking. We had gave up on looking because I had been looking at my bank account, and my bank account did not tell me to go look. <laughs> that too much truth for y'all today or what? For, on, so man. for all of y'all think I got a whole bunch of zeros in the bank account, there, daddy, is that huh? But look, I don't need a whole bunch of money in the bank, you understand? Because the God that I serve... See, look, when you get around your mind wrapped around, see, when you see this $100,000 up in and all of that, you understand, you, God laugh at that kind of stuff. You understand? Look, look, I, I know for a certain, I'm not telling you nothing that I'm thinking God do. I'm telling you what I know because he laughed at me when I went to talk to him about the closing costs that we was going to need. And he didn't laugh at me like, you know, you know, something is wrong with you, boy, and ain't no way in the world you could come up with that kind of money. Right, 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 he laughed right. at me like, you know, it's like if, if, if a man took his son, to the store, and he said, pick out a piece of candy that you want. Uh -huh. And the kid grabbed a piece of candy. He said, this is a piece of candy I want, but it cost a whole quarter. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the man owned the store. Uh, come on, preacher. You understand? Oh. It's, it was that kind of laugh. It was that kind of laugh that he gave me, like, <laughs> you worried about some closing costs. Oh, that's cute. That's cute. You want to know if, when I'm going to move on your behalf by closing costs? He said, your closing costs ain't nothing. That's it. Closing costs ain't nothing for me. Y'all think $100,000 is, is a whole bunch of money for God? Come on, Look, you can run across an accident out here, pull some man out of a car, and he be filthy rich and write you a check for $100,000 before you even get home. Yes, sir. Yes, $100,000 ain't no money. No, but you got to transform your mind. We got to get focused on who God is. We got to press toward him. If we can get into his presence, you under, then you begin to understand. That if he can part a red, how much money do it cost to part a red sea? <laughs> Called faith. Faith. They, they could spend billions of dollars. They would have to spend billions of dollars in order to part that thing. <laughs> or you can part it like this. See, that's what faith look like. <laughs> or you can get all the countries together and you go try to get a whole bunch of financing together and hope, and you can lose 20,000 people's lives while they're trying to part it open. Or you can just say, you want me to do that, Lord? There it is. There it is. But we got to get to that point where we stop worrying about what we see. We got to quit worrying about how we feel. And we got to get into this perpetual mode of pressing forward. God told us, he said, go out and look at the house. Look for the house. I had my wife go home that night, and she wrote a list. I said, write down everything you want so we can pray for it. Amen. Amen. The, the next day, we got up. We went out there, and everything she had on the list was in the house. Woo! But, but that's, that's not hard. Wow. That, that, it's not hard to go out and look for a house. How much, how much faith does it require to get up and go look for a house? Uh -huh. It don't require a lot. That's right. See, but that's where we'll leave off. We'll say, well, we looked at it, looked at and it looked really nice, uh -huh. but uh -huh. that's where we'll get. Yeah. So, yeah, we went and looked at the house. She saw the house. It was really nice. She saw two that were close to each other. I already knew the one she was going to pick. But that was just the beginning. That was the promise. God said he was going to bless us with a house. He said we was going to go out and find a house. We found a house. We could all get on the internet right now and find a house we like. Come on now. 
That ain't, that, that's not the hard part. I had to get on the phone with the mortgage company. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's when things start getting a little bit tight. Uh -huh, <laughs> you understand? Because now Satan is playing games. Yes, he, is, he said, well, look at your bank account. You ain't got enough money in the bank account. What about your credit? And we checked my wife's credit, and there were some errors on her credit. And so I went to run the credit with the folk, and they said, well, you know what? Y'all can't get the loan. Uh -huh. But they said, hold on, but if, it looks like there's some mistakes on her credit. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so there were some mistakes on her credit. And so she got them taken off and worked out, and all of a sudden now we qualify for a loan. Look at that, wow. look at that, look at that. Well, there was some problems with this piece of issue, and there was some problems with this piece of issue. And each time it required me to fill out a document, to make a call, or to do something. Uh -huh. And every one of these that have come up, I've done it speedy. They send me a document, I send it right back. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because I'm pressing forward. Yes, and I really don't care what Satan has to say in the matter. Uh -huh. I'm not concerned about what he say. I'm not concerned about how much money is in the bank account. I'm not concerned about whether this piece of paper come back with the right numbers on it, or if this piece yeah, of paper yeah, come yeah. back on it, or what the closing costs. So I'm not concerned about that because God said. God said. That's where the pressing starts. The press, it don't, it's not hard to press to, to say, to understand, here's the blessing. Yeah, yeah. A husband, a house, a car, a baby. Okay, that's, that's good. If you, can't, if you can't wrap your mind around that, then you need to come on back up here and start over from the beginning. Come on, preacher. Come on now. That was a man named Jesus. All right. You understand? He came out of God. The only begotten son. You need to go back to that. But we all off in here, we didn't, we didn't came past that. Yes. So we need to be through with that. If God says something, that's it. That's it. Let God be true Amen. and every man be a liar. And I probably told you this before, that every man includes you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let you be a liar to you. Yes. So if that's the case, then we need to press forward. Look what happened here. In 27, she, she heard that Jesus came. She heard he was coming. And she came in the press behind him and touched his garment. Mm -hmm. That's what she did. Uh -huh. But see, I want to talk to you about what she thought before what she did. Uh -huh. See, the clue here is in 28. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be made whole. See, she had a mind made up. She had a mind made up. Amen. She had heard about Jesus and what Jesus could do. And her face took over. You understand? In other words, what she did is she, she had a full court press. Yes, sir. Yes. You understand? Do you understand what a full court press is? I don't usually like to give sports analogies because everybody don't understand them, but this one, is pre is, is, this one makes sense here. She pressed. It was a full court press. In, in basketball, most time the defense picks up a half court. Uh -huh. That means that you let the offense run halfway down the court before you start to play defense on them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. See, we play half court defense sometime in our mind. We let Satan run halfway down the court. You understand? We entertain all his thoughts, all his ideas, all his comments. He, we let him lay his whole argument out before we start fighting. And so by the time we start fighting, he done got a foothold in your mind. He kicking your behind all up and down your, your prayer closet, your house, your car, your job. And you can't figure out why you keep losing the battle. Come on, preacher. But look what she did here. She put a full court press on. See, the, the, the thing about a full court press is that you press from the very beginning. See, when you have court press, basically what you do is you, you, you forfeit ground that don't belong to the enemy. You understand? You give up ground that don't belong to the enemy. You say, well, you can play over here. But until you get here, then we're going to have a problem. So you let them build up momentum coming to you before you begin to start something. You say, you know, yeah. You know, that's that line right there. Cross, don't cross that line. And he say, don't cross that line right there. And he just keep on right till he run up there. And he right up there slamming, slamming you upside your head. Putting you on a poster. <laughs> but look, she began to engage in a full court press. She said, look, you don't have no, look, Satan, you don't have no room here. Yeah, yeah. You. you can't open your mouth and say nothing to me. As soon as I realize it's you, you got to go. Yeah, 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 See, yeah. that's where we got to get into. So many times we lose the battle in our mind. Yeah. And because we lose the battle in our mind, then we can't get our actions right. right so if you wonder why your actions never line up with what it is you want to do, you need to go back and address the issues in your mind. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. When yes, Satan sir. shows up in your mind and he wants to tell you this, that, and the other, he wants to bring doubt, procrastination, hindrance in you, and all that other nonsense and junk that you know is not true, what do you do? 
Come on, preacher. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you say, get behind me, Satan? Or do you say, you know what, you might be right. No, my, my bank account is kind of low. They say you got to have a 650 uh, 50 credit score before you can get, even get a house and then you have a real high interest rate. Yes, that's what it says on the website. On the website. Wow. The <laughs> and that's where we'll be. And we won't press. And we won't move forward and do the things that we need to do. But look, her mind was made up. Yes, you could sir. tell her mind was made up by the action that then came forth. Notice she didn't procrastinate. Look, we got a problem procrastinating around here. Come on, preacher. The word procrastinate means to be slow. It means to be late doing something that should be done. To delay until a later time because you don't want to or you lazy. Uh -huh. my, my, my. And it's a sign of disobedience and a lack of faith. And we struggle with that mightily. The Lord will tell us to do something, and we'll come up with every excuse to do that later. And as a result, we don't press. And as a result, God doesn't move. And then we want to sit there and point the finger at God like there's something wrong with him. Like why he didn't do what he said he was going to do. When we know for a fact we ain't did what he told us to do. And if we did do what we told him to do, we had to stake his nasty, his attitude we could find on the, on the rack. To do it in. Look, her mind was right. And when her mind got right, then she was ready. The word of God says that when she had heard of Jesus, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. I need you to understand that she pressed in the midst of the press. You understand? She pushed forward in the midst of a group of people that are pushing forward. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's a bunch of people going to churches. It's a bunch of people pressing and coming together in churches. Uh -huh. But they're not moving Christ. Mm -hmm. You understand? But there was something different about her because she had a mind made up that she was pressing to get him. She wasn't pressing to be seen. She wasn't pressing to get, uh, to get healed so she could get to the club. You understand? She wasn't pressed to see what title she could get in the church. She was pressing because she was trying to get to Jesus. Yes, and it was that pressing in the midst of the press yes, sir. that caused Jesus to notice. Yes, I, need you to, I need you to understand today, brothers and sisters, that if you make up your mind, yes. that when you come in these doors, that when you wake up in the morning, that when you get on your knees, that you are pressing yeah. to get to the glory of God, that you are pressing the grass hold of the claw of the clothes of Jesus Christ, and that and nothing else, then you'll, you'll get God's attention. Yeah, you will. Look, look, what happens here? He got, she got Jesus' attention immediately. That's what we just seem to understand sometimes, immediately. There seems to be this thought that it's, you know, it's a 12-step program that we need to go through in order to get Jesus to move on our behalf. It's not so. What delays us is our, our lack of willingness to press toward him and give, him a, give our all. That's what delays it. That's what delayed her 12 years before she got to this point. And we, we get in the same situation. But it says straightway, the, the, the fountain of her blood dried up. But it also says in 30 that immediately Jesus knew that virtue had gone out of him. And he turned about in the press and he said, who touched my clothes? Now here come the disciples. They all got to weigh in and they got to chime in now. One of the things I've learned about here is that you ask one person a question, that's always somebody else to answer the question. Bishop asked one of my kids a question yesterday, and the other one jumped in, and he was going to answer it for him. Jesus was not talking to the disciples. Who touched my clothes? He was looking for the one that had made contact with him. He wasn't looking for everybody. There was a bunch of people that was in the church. You understand? It was a bunch of people that was up playing with him. Come on now. But he was looking for the one that was pressing through the muck and the mire that said, no matter how hard this gets, no matter if somebody steps on my hand, no matter if somebody pushes me and hurts my feeling, nobody if so, no matter if somebody recognizes me and says, you ain't supposed to be here. I don't care because I got to get to Jesus. Get out of my way, pride. Get out of my way, hate. Get out of my way, my past, because I must get to Jesus. And the word of God says he moved. Hallelujah. And he spoke to her. 
when we stop playing games yeah. with this walk, when we begin to press, an unceasing, unrelenting press toward Jesus, yeah. he'll speak directly to you. Look, that's what he did. He told her. And he saw her. And she came fearing and trembling. Now, she had been doing some fearing and trembling for a long time. But this is a different kind of fearing and trembling that she's doing now. This is a reverence for the Lord. Word of God says she told him all the truth. She said she laid it all out. Sometimes we got a problem laying all the truth out. Amen. We ask you a question. It'll be a little press on you. And now all of a sudden, you don't, all, the, all the truth leave you. You got some of the truth. Parts and bits of the truth. But look here. When she, when she grabbed his clothes, she grabbed the truth. Come on now. You understand? When she grabbed a hold of Jesus Christ, she grabbed the whole truth and nothing but the truth. It wasn't watered down. It wasn't diluted. She grabbed the whole truth. It's no mistake that she would bring him all the truth because that's what she had. She had all the truth. And that's what she brought. And so we have to watch those moments when Satan comes and he says, just give half the truth. Hold the rest. Mm -hmm. That we bring all the truth to say, you're a liar. Mm -hmm. As I come to a close, I need you to point out uh, something to you. That this story about this woman takes place in the midst of another press. The word of God says that there's a man named Jairus uh -huh. whose daughter was sick. He had gone through a press of his own. He had heard about Jesus. He had put aside his pride. And he was walking with Jesus to solve a problem. Yeah, yeah. And the word of God says that while they were on their way to solve his problem, her problem arose. Her problem and so Jesus stopped and helped her with her problem. Oh, Look, everybody here don't, are not going to get blessed at the same time. We all on different paths. Do not let Satan trick you into getting and having problems with your brothers and sisters and not rejoicing with them when they get blessed. That's right. Yeah. Do not let Satan trick you and think that your blessing is not coming because somebody else's blessing got there before yours did. Don't even give the devil room in that nonsense. Because look, here's what the friends came. Look, his peoples came. That's what it said in 35, while he yet spake, while he was talking to the one with the issue of blood. And while Jairus was probably sitting there saying, come on, Lord, come on, Lord, come on, Lord, I need you to move on my behalf. He, instead of glorifying God, that he was showing that he had the ability to heal her, that he could also do this. Uh -huh. But look what he said. He says, uh, the synagogue from, they came from, the synagogue, from, the, from his house, and they said, the daughter is dead. Why trouble us, the master, any further? In other words, he said, that situation that you was walking with Jesus about, that thing that you were concerned about, that you had been praying about, is dead. Leave it alone. Quit bothering Jesus with that. That's what they told him. There's people going to come to you and it's going to tell you that. Why you got that little old dusty park lot over there with one car on it? Why don't you just go on and close that down? You don't have no need for that. What you doing? It's always, it's always naysayers out there. But I have to close and I have to tell you, look what he says in 36. But as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, in other words, as soon as the haters opened their mouth, Soon as Satan put his two cents in, he had something to say. When Satan opens his mouth to speak in your life, do you allow yourself to hear what Jesus has to say on the matter? Look what he says. He says, be not afraid. Only believe. He says, stop being fearful. Stop doubting. Stop hesitating. Only put your trust in me. Trust me completely, wholeheartedly. With everything you have, regardless of what you see, regardless of what you think, regardless of what you know, regardless of how you feel, stop it, stop it, stop it. Trust me. There you go. Amen. If we can get ourselves in a position where we say, you know what, Lord? Say it with me if you're able to. Lord, I trust you. No matter what. I trust you. I trust you, Lord. If you're not already saying that several times a day, you should be. Because we're in a press. And there's comfort when you tell the Lord, you know what, I trust you and I'm going to press. Satan has no room. If you continue to press, you will enter in. You will enter into the blessings and the promises he has for you on this side. But more importantly, you will enter in 
into what he has for you on the other side. May the Lord bless you and keep you as my prayer.